Hello out there in Nala land. We begin today, Parshas Vayichi, Mirz Hashem, the story of the ending, the blessings to Yaakov's sons. Today's shir, as always, learn Leilu Nishmas, Rocha Leah, Basav Chaim Tzvi, Leah Shalom. Shem Yitzchos, for all these people learning. It's very encouraging for me. I always get regards wherever I travel throughout the world. Somebody who's heard me in Nala, I am probably the only one left who hasn't seen any Nala Shurim, but I'm sure one day that'll come to an end. But the great service that is done by the offices, and they're such modest people, we don't say by name, and headquartered in Washington Heights and in Beit Shemesh. And uh, I'd probably get away with mentioning the technician here in the, in the studio, Libby Bamser. Thank you for all the wonderful work of the Nala people. Their design, their agenda is to bring you Torah. I hope I can have some modest role in all of this. Okay, Vaichi, first let's begin with the summary because this is a difficult parsha to tell the story because there's a little bit of a story we'll tell in the beginning and a little bit of a story we'll tell in the end. But when it comes to the blessings, I just have to ask you to look over the verses, uh, look at Rashi, look at Sham Shafal Hirsch, uh, but there's no story there that I can tell you. Very quick summary, which is, Yaakov reached the age of 147, and the end of his days was approaching. He sent for Yosef and made him promise that he would bury Yaakov in Canaan, the resting place of his fathers, instead of in Egypt. Sometime later, Yosef was informed that Yaakov was ill, Yosef visits him with his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Yaakov told Yosef that Ephraim and Manasseh should be counted among Yaakov's own sons. In other words, they're going to, as it were, skip a generation. There's the Avos, Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov. And some say, actually, that Yosef was such an unbelievable, he's the only one referred to as a tzadi. There's like this four, four father, four, there are four, F-O-U-R, four mothers, F-O-R-E. There should have been four F-O-U-R, Four fathers, F-O-R-E, uh, and Yosef would have been the fourth one. That didn't happen. But what did happen was that Yosef's sons actually jump up a generation. They become counted as if they are from the 12 tribes. This is where it gets complicated, and it's beyond the purview of our shir. Uh, each one of these two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, would each be the head of a different shevet of the tribe of Yaakov's sons. Yaakov brings his sons closer to Yaakov, Yaakov kisses them, he hugs them, and he blesses them. We begin. Parshas Vayechi, uh, which is a closed Parsha, there's no opening. Also here, many, many reasons. Fret not, fret not, I've already made my bracha beforehand. Okay, the closed section of the Torah. 28, Parsha 28. Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, and the days of Yaakov, the years of his life, were 147 years. The time approached for Israel to die, Israel, Yisrael, Yaakov. So he called for son Yosef, and we'll see son Yosef was the most influential one there, of course, he, he yielded the power. He said to him, please, if I found favor in your eyes, please place your hand under my thigh, and do kindness and truth with me, please do not bury me in Egypt. What's the request? Yaakov sees that his death is nearing. He calls Yosef, the only son who wields any power, and please promise me that you will not bury me in the land of Egypt, but you'll bury me in the Marat HaMachpelah, which is in the land of Israel. Several reasons he has for insisting upon this. Uh, perhaps the most famous is the one that Rashi quotes. He didn't want the Egyptians to turn him into a shrine, an idol. They're liable to worship him, so just get me out of here. Let me go to where my forefathers were buried in Maras Machpelah, which is in Hebron. Take me to the land of Canaan. He also wants to establish a principle that Eretz Yisrael is the heritage of the Jewish people. No matter how comfortable we may become in any other land. Uh, but, and he saw was very concerned now that people were starting to get very comfortable in Egypt. Therefore, he wants to establish a principle to bring that to make sure that I don't want to be here. This is not my, this is not my uh, homeland. This is not where I belong. Please have me buried the land where I do belong, which is the land of Israel. Uh, Rabbi Bullman, Rabbi Nachman Bullman, his father, when he came to America, he said, uh, we've had many, many, uh, many gullahs and many, many exiles, but the problem with the one in America is it's the first time people actually think they're home. Other people always understood that no matter where we go, it's time. Uh, we don't belong here. We may have it good here, but we don't belong here. When they came to Poland at first, they were running away. They thought it was really good. Poland, this will be the place where we'll stay, where we'll rest, until they realized how Poland was the, the 
eye of the storm, of the, of the fulcrum of anti-Semitism. Okay. And Yaakov lives in the land of Egypt. It says, Vayichi, and he lived rather than Vayagar, he sojourned. Uh, this is the quality of Yaakov's life. After a lifetime of tremendous difficulty, the very end in, in Egypt was a time of... Uh, things much easier than the life before of difficulty. Asaph's hatred, Lovzen's conniving, Yosef's disappearance. Finally, he's able to have tranquility and harmony as he lives in Egypt. And he asks him to place his hand. It means make an oath. In other words, Yaakov is not willing to accept an informal promise from Yosef. It's not that he had a lack of trust in Yosef, but it's, very, it's a reflection of pragmatic, pragmatic assessment 